Welcome everyone back to the Senior Care Summit 2024. My name is Pam Dunwald. I am one of your nurse advocates from Your Nurse Advocates Consulting. And today we are adding another uh, video to our category one, which is supporting caregivers and family dynamics. So I'm really excited to introduce you to Laura Donnelly. She is the founder and director of Body Brain Balance, and she helps teach people move out of pain. And so we're really excited to have Laura here today. We're going to just kind of have a discussion, talk about, um, you know, tips that you can do for self-care. We're going to talk about, you know, some family dynamics and some sibling relationships that come into play when we're caring for an aging parent. So we're going to try and and, and touch base on a, on a little bit of all of that. So welcome, Laura. It's nice to have you. Thank you, Pam. I'm so excited to be here because, um, as you know, helping caregivers stay healthy as they care for the people they love is really close to my heart. Um, having taken care of my mom, a lot of what I learned is from personal experience. And one of the things you and I talked about was uh, how, how after we've taken care of somebody for a period of time, then we know a lot of stuff. But before we start, almost everything is unknown mm -hmm. about what's going to happen, how it's going to work. And one of the things that... Uh, that my brother and I discovered in terms of, of sibling things is that by the time we were taking care of my mom together, he and I had lived apart probably close to 40 some odd years in terms of having different life experiences. And so we had really different outlooks on living and dying and just being in the world. Uh, we had a lot of things that were the same. Uh, one of the wonderful things is my brother cooked um, a lot. He was a good, he's a good cook, but he cooked a lot of family meals for us while we were staying in my mom's home and she was in hospice care. He cooked a, a lot of favorite family recipes, which over time, those were not the foods I cooked all the time, but they were comfort foods for the three of us, my mom and my brother and myself. And this, this was a gift that he could give to, to all of us. But it was also um, one of the only ways he knew how to help. I mean, he, he actually, that's not true. He was trained as an occupational therapist early in his uh, career. And so he was very good at uh, doing kind of personal things like helping somebody move out of a mm. chair and into a new chair. And uh, the the deep personal connection, something that meant something that's kind of beyond words. That was what he did with cooking. And I could let him do that. Um, even though I might've made different food, made different choices for health, it wasn't that important, you know? And but the other things, how how uh, how people live and how people die and what you need to do. He he was still working very hard to engage my mom in staying in, engaged in her life when she was really pulling back and kind of becoming more quiet and wanting to uh, disengage from from things and. It, it was hard. It's hard when that happens. Mm -hmm. And now, but where, I, yeah, I was going to ask where, where are you? Who is older? You or your brother? I'm older. Okay. So how did that play? Uh, and and that, yeah. Well, I ha uh, I had always kind of been the junior mom after mm -hmm. my dad died. You know, my mom had to take over a lot of the financial stability roles. And so I took over a lot of the household roles. So I ended up bossing around my brother a lot when he was growing up, poor guy. And um, and so that's a pattern that's that as adults, we, we worked very hard to unravel. But under tension, a lot of those childhood patterns jumped back up into the forefront because Fear of loss triggers a lot of your childhood 
things. And it, and since we had gone through a big loss when my dad died, most of our life as children was spent making sure our mom was safe because if she wasn't, what was going to happen to us? Mm -hmm. And so that fear of loss came back up with a lot of the, of the things we did. So I, I would share with people to pay attention. If you start hearing yourself saying stuff that you said when you were 10 or 12 to your siblings, if you fall back into, um, well, this person always what got first dibs on anything that, you know, that we had or that we made or, oh yeah, really? You know, we're 50, 60. Is this really still important to talk about? But, but emotions are complicated and they're not logical. So, you know, what I said, well, wait, really, you know, we're, we're in our forties, fifties, sixties. This, this shouldn't mean anything. That's not how your heart feels. That's not how your little inner child person feels. So one of the things I uh, share with people is if you're saying something that you don't usually say, just take a pause. Give yourself a minute to recollect. There's a lot in caregiving that you have no control over. But one of the things you do have control over, well, I don't know that you do in the beginning. When a crisis happens, you go into crisis management. And then, then if the caregiving continues for a period of time, you have time to come back out of crisis management into your more normal self and and pay attention better. But But in the, like if somebody has a fall or, uh, in the case of my mom, she had uh, she would get really bad pneumonia, and we would be called to fly in from both coasts and, um, you know, do everything, get her back on her feet, get her well, get her out of the hospital, get you know, just all all the things, all the things. And my brother and I are were pretty good at working together on that, but when things leveled out, we had real differences of opinion about what would be good long term for our mom. Fortunately, she could still tell us what she was going to do. And that was just it. <laughs> she she was in a good enough uh, mental condition to say, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Um, but uh, like I went to visit her and she had a COPD. She had an exacerbation. We went to the doctor and the doctor said, okay, we can do this, this, this. And my mom said, yes, or I can go into hospice, right? And I'm like, wait. What are, you, what are you talking about? And he goes, and that, but you talking to my mom, the doctor. And, and in my head, I'm saying, wait, I didn't say anything out loud. And he goes, we talked about that. And these are the uh, caregiving options in the community. And she said, I've picked this one. He said, I'll write you a prescription. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of just in shock. And I take my mom home and I said, what, what, How, what's going on? She said, well, I'm tired of this. I'm just tired of this. And she was 80 seven or 88 at the time. And she said, I get something. I do all the treatment. You know, I'm, I've been here. I get something. I do all the treatment. I come back here. I get something else. I fall down here. I don't come in. She said, I never get back to where I felt good. And so then because of my training and my life, I'm like, okay, what do you need from me? And she said, I just need you to help me get this all set up and to support me till I die, you know, to take care, you know, help me take care of myself. I want to stay in my house, the whole thing. So then of course I had to call my brother cause I was there, older sister on site, call the, call the brother. And I'm, I'm like, dude, you got to get out of here immediately. You got to get out of here. <laughs> I was not cool. I was not cool. I was not ready for this. And, and my brother's like, I just talked to her the other day. She was fine. This can't be this bad. And I'm like, that's why I said, please come, because you don't have to believe me. You just have to believe mom. So 
so we worked all that out. And it, and it for us, we were able to do something that was really good. We both stayed with her at different times and we stayed all together. Now, the, the unfortunate thing for me, I told you I was the junior mom. I was, you know, I stepped into this role. This was not a good, it was a, a very good role in my family and it allowed us to survive when I was young. Is not a good role for me as a, a as a human, as an evolving human and a growing up person. So I would I would stay there, but with the three of us, he would fall back into his patterns of of what he did as a kid, and I would try to do too much, and he would kind of flake out and go visit his friends, and and then rush back and do a big showy thing, you know, like make spaghetti and and. And he would go out with his friends in the evening with spaghetti sauce all over the stove where he had you know, cooked it. In, it was great food, but it, who got to clean it? So, so sometimes I would just <clears throat> go home and visit my, you know, I said, I have to go home and see my husband. I said, I have a whole life. I'm trying to keep on track. You're here. You need time with mom yourself. And, it's, and after about two days, he would call me and he'd go, mom says she likes it better when three of us are here. And I'm like, it's not healthy for me to stay too long when the three of us are here together. Because I can't resist. We had this we had this little triangle of, of energy. I can't resist that very well. And it's not healthy for me. So I need you to buck it up <laughs> and be there for her. Plus, you need to finish things. She and I have had a lot of time to talk because I lived closer than he lived. Mm -hmm. And I said, we are in have pretty much dealt with all the things we had left unsaid for the whole of our lives. And we're in a good place. I said, but, but you're a guy, guys are different than girls. You have a different relationship and there needs to be space. And so, so also when one person is, is a crazy caretaker, they might not leave space for the siblings mm -hmm. to have that one-on-one -on -one time with the parent to, to create some healing. It is, um, there's a lot of healing that happens when you're caring for somebody and um, caring for somebody because not out of, of duty or requirement, but, but because you love that person and, and you want to care for them. And at the same time, emotions are, can be like a tangled ball. They can just be like all jammed up and, uh, fear of loss, unknown what's going to happen, do, you know, how are we going to take care of whatever might come up because there's always something that comes up and and uh it can be very if if people get emotional well and the person who's who is being cared for is very emotional. They probably have had a loss of function of some kind, unclear if it's going to come back, so they have fear for themselves if they're in hospice and and preparing to die that's a whole unknown journey and so so you're dealing with their emotions you're dealing with your emotions you're dealing with your siblings emotions in the cauldron of uh, being um and it, it can be complicated so t taking time for yourself which isn't easy in the middle of caregiving so even just brief moments where say you go outside or you go to a window and you look out where there's some space and you breathe so that when you go back into the situation with your siblings or your parent um, or your spouse, you are coming back from a slightly calmer place and you can see more of the threads of your emotions. You know, this is left over from when I was a kid. This is not necessary to be here now. Here now, we're happy. You know, here now we had, we had, uh, we made bacon for my mom every morning for breakfast because she loved bacon. And, and what's the deal? She doesn't have to worry about her weight. She doesn't have to worry about her heart. She doesn't have to worry about anything. <laughs> so we made bacon every day. And I, I was unloading the dishwasher while the bacon was cooking and I was whistling, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, we we had uh, my brother's musician, it's my mom was a musician and a dancer, I was a dancer. So 
musicals and, and art were important in our lives. My brother, he, he just said to me, Laura, how can you be happy? And, and I, I felt so bad for my brother, right? I felt so bad for him because my life took me somewhere where I could pay attention to just this moment right now. And that was what I think was really uh, helped me to take care of my mom is just this moment, what's, what's going good? Well, the bacon's cooking, we have orange juice, the sun is shining in the window. Every, every this moment, everything is fine. She feels good today. She's talking. My brother's there. I'm there. What what is wrong? What's wrong is in the future. What's wrong is that she is going to die. But right now, she's not. Well, it's me. She's not dying any more than the rest of us are always dying every moment that we are alive. We are always on path to dying so that in that moment she was there but so were we so in the moment let's just have the bacon and orange juice and watch the sun and the birds out the window and be be here now and my brother is just like I can't even believe you because I did tell him that I tried I could I tried to <laughs> I tried to pull my brother into the let's be happy in this moment and and he's like I'm a guy guys are supposed to solve problems you know, and, and, you know, so he was great. He put up any grab bars we needed. He, he did all of the modifications in the house. He, you know, any, give him anything like that. And he was, okay, I got something I can do. That's going to help. Let him cook something he can do. That's going to help, but to just be in the moment and to know, to know that every breath takes you one step further down the road he could he couldn't do that and there's nothing he could do to change that and so for him that was uh stressful really stressful you know he said i ha i hate that i can't do anything to help and so i try i tried to say yes i i don't think anyone can do anything to help but how do you take care of yourself in this situation when when there is nothing to be done but to be present and to provide comfort. Because, because when he would get agitated, then he and I would bicker. Oh, that was naughty. That was naughty. It we didn't even know we were doing it. It was such a childhood habit. Yeah. Yeah. And we would just be going, you know, about nothing, about nothing, nothing important. Not, you know, not who was going to go buy the coffee, not, not anything. And one day the hospice nurse was there and she said, uh, y'all, you can't do this. This is terribly upsetting to your mother. We didn't even realize that because probably because as children, we did it not in the room where she was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but I looked at him and I said, well, I'm not even mad at you. He goes, I know. I said, okay, stress. So it's important. Um, how we look at things and it's important to give ourselves space mental space which is hard sometimes i would stay up really late because the only time i could have quiet in the house my brother was in bed my mom was asleep you know and then then i'm staying up way too late but i needed just empty quiet time not a lot maybe 10 minutes 15 minutes now, if I could have let him stay up with my mom and put her to bed and I had taken a little nap before I stayed up all the night, that would have been more helpful. It, it didn't occur to me. We we are kind of the, you know, you only lay down if you're sick kind of people. Uh, oh, that's interesting too. You will have all these family habits that will, will come back to you that are um, things you remember. That, that you didn't even know you remembered, but they're common beliefs. So, so for people to, <clears throat> to pay attention to their own body and listen to their body is, is how, it's how I manage stress, how I manage when I start to get upset. 
it's how I uh, support caregivers in 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 looking at what is. That's one of the first most important things, which I'm pretty sure you guys do with with your nurse advocacy all along. What is the situation? You know, if somebody can't do stairs anymore and they've got stairs in their house, can you live on the ground floor? Not do you want to live on the ground floor, but this is this way. So how do we how do we work with what is? And and how do I deal when I don't want to accept what is myself personally? Am I going to get angry? Am I going to get frustrated? Am I going to give myself a stomach ache? Or am I going to take take a moment and say, honest and truly, if I'm upset, how do I touch my mom? If 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 I'm angry, you know, because what I t tell people is, in your system, extra tension anywhere is extra tension everywhere. And, and you can test it by just making a fist. And you know, I make a fist and then I feel it in my throat right away. My throat's tight. I just squeeze my fist. Then I stop squeezing. And, and everything in my body goes, thank you, thank you. So if I would hear my voice, you know, my mom would say, can, can you get me this? Can you get me that? What else would she say? I'd be doing the dishes. Can't you just come in here and sit down? Do you always have to be moving? She would say. <laughs> and I'm try, trying to keep things going, you know? <laughs> and I would find myself ready to say, I just have to finish this. And I would, I would, uh, I would, st I would stop because I would feel interrupted and I would feel like I couldn't get everything done. And I would, I would, I would then I would say, just a minute. Give, give me just a minute, please. And then I would check in with my own self and say, okay, what, what's important? Her or these dishes? Calm down. Your agenda, Laura, is to get the dishes all done by this time and put away and whatever. That's not her agenda. Can I? And then, and then I would just talk down a little bit, listen to my body. Then I could go in and sit. And sometimes I just sat there and we would just hold hands. We weren't watching TV. <clears throat> we weren't reading anything. We were just sitting on the couch. She had pretty art on the walls. We would look at that and we would hold hands. And it was more important to her that time than how neat the kitchen was. In the childhood, no. The kitchen being neat was really important, which is what I was functioning on without even knowing. I was functioning on that old program and she was on a new program. So there was, my brother's more in temperament like my mom and it was kind of interesting. She was very nervous and active and busy all of her life. And so when she really slowed down, that was also a, what do I want to say? That required us to deal with her differently because she was not as we expected her to be. <clears throat> and and especially as people age, I think that that's one of the things that um, is, is maybe a great relief about aging, that you, you can say, yes, I was that way, but I don't have to be that way now. I don't have to keep doing those things. And for uh, family members to allow that to happen, that takes a lot of uh, support. And and for my brother, you know, he he wanted to arrange a small concert to come in and people to play music in the house. And I'm like, why don't you ask her if she wants a lot of people in the house? He said, but she loves music. I said, I know. And she loved to go to concerts and she she loved all of this but ask her if she still wants to participate in it before you go to all the trouble to arrange for something to happen. And he, and he was like, but, but if she doesn't want that anymore, I said, right. 
that's an that's another ending for for us mm -hmm. an ending of of who we knew her to be mm -hmm. who she isn't anymore and um and now that I'm talking to you, I'm thinking, you know, he really did, he did really a good job considering the fact that my mom and I, and okay, we might've been weird, but we, but we talked about all things, living and dying and uh, growth and change and uh, spiritual things. And, and so we had always shared ideas about this, but I, I don't, think that my brother and my mom had talked about these things that much. So they didn't necessarily have a, a communication channel for that in the beginning when he got there. And uh, so, and you know, and you know, and when I left and said to him, you know, when I went home and took a little bit for a week and said, you have to take care of this. You know, you have to make a relationship with mom. It's you and you and her need to deal with. That's the big sister bossing him around again. You know, all I need to say is I trust you. Take care of everything that needs to be done. I need to be at my house for a few days mm -hmm. to keep the rest of my life limping along as best I can. Mm -hmm. And but but I did push on him quite a bit because uh, because as you said those roles. What is your role in the family? You know, who, who is that? And we also talked about long distance care. And when one person is in the same location and all the care lands on them, then the people who feel far away, this is what happened to um, my husband when, when he was caring for his mother. Both of his sisters lived out of state. They couldn't tell how she was. They couldn't see what she needed. They just had their mind the last time she had been able to go out there and visit, which was actually several years before he was taking care of her. And uh, and then they would call him and try and boss him around from, you know, states away. And that's very hard. That's, that's hard. Actually, it's hard for, for both sides. It's hard for the people who can't be there, who feel guilty that they can't be there and feel like they should do something. It's hard for the person who's on, on site, who is doing everything they can, and is exhausted and emotionally stressed out. And there probably needs to be a family mediator now that I pause a moment. You know, it, uh, I, I have other friends and they are, they are struggling with, um, the, the thing there's three of them and who was who was always the favorite who always got the best stuff when I'm sure that their mom was fair you know mm -hmm. I'm sure that you know if she had a hundred dollars she spent thirty three dollars and thirty three cents for each kid for Christmas but it's all about you know? perception yes <laughs> yeah yeah perception and um Mm. And then there's there's wanting, and then there's the uh, never. I never received this from my parent. Can you be okay as an adult if you never do receive this from your parent? You know, can you can you say, I wish that that had happened. I wish that I had had that kind of a relationship, but I don't, and it's. It's okay. So again, that's coming back to the, coming back to you as the caregiver. How do you take care of yourself? And by care of yourself, I mean not stressing, not pulling out your hair, not churning up age old family stuff. It's not that you don't feel the things, it's just you don't stay in that feeling. You, you take yourself out of that feeling because that was the past and the past is gone. The future isn't here. We have right now. And what's important right now is, is to have the deepest heart connection. You, even if your person has dementia, uh, when I, I would sit with my husband's uh, mother and 
and we would hold hands. A great deal can be communicated through touch. And uh, we would sit out in the sun and watch the birds. And she could uh, she could still talk, but she didn't know my name, you know. She, but she would say, "There you are," and I would say, "Here I am." And she would see something the birds did. Did you see that? And I, yes, I saw that. And we would spend an hour, maybe. And <clears throat> it was really good for me, preparation for me to take care of my mother, to learn to slow down, and to just hang out, and watch the birds, look at the paintings on the wall, hold somebody's hand, and to realize that that is enough, especially if you're a doer and a fixer. Mm -hmm. So to Laura, be in a position at... where there's... Mm -hmm. go, I'm go sorry, go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to say... say, when you're stuck... <laughs> okay. We're go good. right ahead. Go right ahead, Laura. I was, well, you get stuck in a position you can't do and you can't fix. You can just be. And and to let yourself do that, that's kind of a gift to the person you're supporting. I was going to say, if you could give three suggestions or three tips for someone to try and um, be cognizant, be aware of, of providing themselves with, with self-care as a, a caregiver, what might maybe those three tips be. This is good. <clears throat> Stay in touch with your body. Your body will know things before your mind things. And your mind will have a list and an agenda of all the things that have to be done. But your body will know you need to sit down now. That takes a little bit of um, move focus from outward to all the things you have to do and all the, whoever you're caring for, whatever they need, it brings you back to yourself. And then one of the, the big things I would ask myself, remind myself I don't have to do stuff as fast as I can, as perfectly as I can, as much as I can, I would, you know, I would say, how simply can I do this task that needs to be done? And to remember that less is more when you're taking care of somebody and taking care of yourself. You know, I don't, I don't need to go to a spa day. I could simply make sure I had some of my favorite hand lotion so that when my hands get dry i i get i put that on and just a little tiny taking care of myself um and to pay attention to our mind i think journaling is really helpful not that you would ever let anyone see it you know a, a journal doesn't have to be at all public but but for all the things you don't know and are worried about and you know just just write them in in the book and the page and don't look at them again um i think that that it can be very create that space i was talking about you know and sometimes writing something out lets you know you know i really don't need to talk to my sibling about this you know my brother or my sister or whatever this is my perception of this, and this may not be an accurate perception. And it's not important that we sort it out here and now. You know, using my journal, then that the uh, journal is a great place too for emotions. You know, you know, I'm you know I'm so angry that this, and and you just write it and write it and write it and write it, and then you're like, okay, can I do anything about that? That's, this is the key for me too. Is this mine or is this someone else's? Because um, because boundaries, I think, when you start giving boundaries, get a little bit fuzzy. And 
uh, especially the reason I didn't like this triangle in my family. And this would be other siblings would have to look at family dynamics that lock back into place. Uh, the three of us treated each other as interchangeable cogs, like as if we were um, understudies in a performance. It's so funny, but this was his. My brother could do everything I could do. Whether he liked to or not, he had all the same skills. I had all the skills that he had. My mom had the same things. And so if I couldn't do something when we were taking care of my mom, I expected him to do it exactly the way I would have it done because, because it was the job that needed to happen, not the person. And that was part of the uh, unraveling that thing for me as I, as I grew up. And so it was to recognize that pattern, to honor that it had been essential at a time in my life and was no longer essential, and to give all of us permission to do something a different way. And that was really part of the healing of my family when we were taking care of my mom was to to release that that dynamic and uh, okay so did I give three things yes you did writing a journal <laughs> yes you did Good. yes I love I love the journaling and, because you know sometimes you can be so upset and it's just it really isn't the time and the place to verbalize that you know whether it's in front of your parent or in front of your sibling but just getting it down on paper, you can still get out those emotions and you can still, you know, write everything down and it just, it, it unloads and you don't have to do it in front of someone. And, and it, it just, it can, can channel that. I really love that idea about journaling. So Laura, as, as we wrap up, we've looked at family dynamics. We've looked at how the importance of self-care and that it doesn't have to be a spa day. It can be just a you know, a simple break, like you said, with the hand lotion. Is there, when it comes to providing self-care or thinking about yourself in this caregiving process, is there anything that you'd like to say that maybe we we haven't talked about in, in wrapping up? Yes, that everything is connected. Our minds, our bodies, our hearts, our emotions, they're all connected. So when one is out of balance, it will knock the others out of balance. And um, just, just something as simple as squeezing your fist and stopping squeezing in the middle of the day is enough to bring your awareness to the fact that you that things might be out of balance and to just reset, like a micro reset that's also a self-care thing, a micro reset of your whole system. So that, that you know, you just squeeze and let go and your body goes, oh, I'm back here now. Mm -hmm. And th that that can save you. It can save you in a doctor's appointment. Uh, it can save you if, if you uh, have to get up in the middle of the night for the fifth time, you know. You just take a moment before you, before you go in to see the person and you just squeeze your hand and let go. And then, you, then you're back in the present moment to do whatever needs to be done. It's kind of like a reset button. <laughs> it is. It is. I should, I should coin that term. <laughs> <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> but that's what, when you were describing Pam, thank it. Thank you so much. Yeah, when you were describing it, that's what made made me think about. Okay, that's just just hit that reset button, you know. But um, Laura, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time out and sharing your insights, sharing your experiences. I know a lot of times just knowing, you know, that we're not alone, you know, and going through some processes and going through the caregiving challenges is always also very comforting and top of all the words of wisdom that, that you've had. So I, I want to thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for including me in this beautiful summit full of caring people. Well, thank you. And we'll see everyone back at the next session.